welcome to you to this service, which is both live in Castle Hill and online and on the dial-up service of the Ipswich and East United Reformed Churches. Welcome to you as we all worship together. Our call to worship. Those who trust in God are like the mountains, immovable and abiding. God shelters the people today and for eternity. We sing out loud or in our hearts. Please remain seated and please leave your masks on for those who are here in church. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. prayers today. We praise you, O Lord, the God of grace. No one of us is worthy to approach you, O God, creator of the universe, holy and all-powerful. Yet you have approached us and have shown us the human face of your love in Jesus your Son and our Saviour. He revealed your love and mercy by living as he did, serving others and accepting them as people made in your image and likeness. Jesus pointed us towards a world in which each and every person could realise his or her identity as precious children of yours. He even gifted us with the Holy Spirit so that the very fabric of our existence is woven with the thread of his life. Lord God, may this time of worship be a true reflection of our thanksgiving, wonder and praise over such blessings. 
We pray this in Jesus. Amen. And most holy God, we are taught in your word that love is the fulfilling of the law. Forgive our failures to love. Forgive our little love for you, our waywardness and our ingratitude. We have not loved you with our whole being, with heart, soul, mind and strength. Forgive us our little love for others, our selfishness and unkindness. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves or cared for them as we ought to have cared. In your love and mercy, blot out our offences and sow in our hearts the seeds of your love that they may bear abundant fruit. Jesus calls us and forgives us. Sisters and brothers, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And we continue as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our reading today comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. of a Syro-Phoenician woman. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hands on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to the heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephrata, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plenty. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, Mick. Join with me in prayer for a few moments. Lord God, in the silence or the storms in our hearts, Help us to hear your words today. Take the words I've prepared, 
filter them through your spirit so that we all hear a message for each of us today. Amen. Some of you may remember the Billy Graham Crusades for Christ when it was in London in the 50s and the 60s. Perhaps you can remember the song, It is no secret what God can do, being sung by the booming baritone of Cliff Barrows, the song leader and crusade soloist. Or you might know the uh, Elvis Presley version. He sang, What he's done for others, he'll do for you. The phrase, it is no secret what God can do, seems precisely to express a central thrust of this passage from Mark. There is no keeping secret the things God has done in Christ, for the more God does, the more urgently and forthrightly the story is told. But as we look around us this, these days, any careful observer of the church would reveal that the song is wrong. There seems to be a secret going around. Mark's gospel is famous for its sense of urgency. I can't remember how many times the word immediately is used. In this portion of his gospel, the secret is presented, but it's kept rather unsuccessfully. Jesus tries to hide in the region of Tyre, not part of the Jewish homelands, but is discovered there and begged by the Gentile woman to cast out a demon out of her daughter. After this unsuccessful weekend in a B&B &B away, Jesus goes back to work in the area of Galilee. Here he tries to perform the healing of a deaf man away from the spying eyes of the crowd. He even strongly warns the people not to report what they have witnessed, but the people disobey and proclaim the message boldly and broadly. Looking around us, it seems to me that God's people are much better at obeying this strange command of Jesus, the warning to keep everything secret. Most of his other commands are a real challenge to us. How can we turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, love our enemies, forgive unceasingly, love God with heart, soul, mind and strength? These things come hard. They are difficult commands to follow. And finally, in this story, we have an admonition from Jesus that is actually quite easy for us to follow. As if we too were warned not to tell anyone, many present-day followers of Jesus all too gladly keep the secret that they're Christians and they have faith. The more he tells us to keep it to ourselves, the more we obey. There is a secret what God can do. What God has done for some, God will be hard-pressed, obviously, to do for others. Why is it that we keep this secret so well? It's no wonder, then, that the church, which once grew like a firestorm, now seems to have hit a firewall. We live in what is called the post-Constantinian era. Constantine from the year 326 became emperor and the state followed the emperor when governments promoted the church. But in this era, the government no longer gives preference to Christian teachings. We live in a secular society. Formerly Christian countries, including ours, have now become mission fields. And even strange Australians come to make you Christian. Believers still gather in churches, 
but they gather in dwindling numbers. Why? Because of the secret. If God is doing anything in people's lives, Christians aren't terribly noisy about it. Now, the first option to understand this problem is, of course, that God isn't very active anymore. But I have a problem with that. One of numerous examples. We did a Christianity Explored course online earlier this year. And there was an excited questioning and enthusiasm and a wonder when we shared how God is active in our lives. So I don't suggest that it is because God is inactive. It is rather that God's word is not being urgently spoken and lived out. There are corners of Christianity, of Christendom if you will, where the faith is on the rise due to the urgent sharing of God's love, but in many places like our country, the church has ceased to grow, in part because of God's people are hard of hearing and slow of speech. Perhaps it is because there is a privilege in being a recipient of a secret blessing. Any earthly treasure has a limit, and perhaps if shared too broadly, it will be dissipated and eventually run dry, like so many of our bank accounts. One might get the impression from Christians today that the resources of God's love are similarly finite. Those who bathe in God's grace know the blessings of salvation and the comfort that faith brings. But unfortunately, there seems little urgency for sharing the good news. It is as if spreading God's love around would be squandering what we can't afford. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. The crowd did not obey, but we do. All too easily, the gospel is kept within church walls or the rooms of our home. This is not merely a minister's indictment of the church, it's also a confession. On reflection, even as a minister, I'm aware that it's far easier to proclaim Christ from the pulpit than it is to talk faith in the high street or the workplace or over the garden fence. Here the good news of God's love is spoken Outside, however, it is easier to keep things to ourselves and not report what we have witnessed and felt in our hearts. That's one reason that I'm excited about the next Christianity Explored course that we intend to run later this year. Christianity Explores allows us to really talk about our faith and become enthusiastic about it. It allows us to get used to expressing doubts and problems, but also our enthusiasm for what God has done and is doing in our lives. And I wonder, if we get used to talking about and being enthusiastic about God and how he is active in our lives to each other in relatively safe situations, because most of us don't bite, at least not too often, I wonder if we just might find our enthusiasm spilling outside the walls here or where we live. To phrase it another way, perhaps in a more negative way, I wonder if our lack of willingness to be openly enthusiastic about our faith that we know is real is because we fail to talk about it, explore it, question it and rejoice in it even among ourselves. You see, there is no shortage of the supply of God's love. The message of Christ is not to be hoarded, nor can it be concealed. It is a wonder that congregations like ours, and yes, ministers like me, 
can be so often deaf and dumb. Deaf to God's voice in our midst, dumb to express what God has done and continues to do in and through our lives. It is, however, a wonder of wonders that God can make the deaf hear and the dumb speak, as in our Bible reading today. We are more than recipients of grace. Friends, we are also messengers. And when God so works in our lives as to move us to share our faith, we may find ourselves astonished and acknowledged with the biblical crowd. He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. May it be so in our lives. Amen. Let us sing together, I heard the voice of Jesus say. Oh, Jesus said, come on to me and rest. Lay down, O weary one, lay down your head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, forlorn and faint and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, You won't let me be clear. The living water, thirsty ones to down and drink and come to our time of prayer. Firstly, a prayer for the offering that is uh, out the door. Please don't forget to put your offering in it as you leave. And then our prayers of intercession. And in the prayers of intercession, the phrase is, our God is here. He comes to save us. Our God is here. He comes to save us. So let's pray. Lord God, for the gifts we bring, we offer these gifts and our lives of signs that our faith is expressed not in words alone, but in deeds. Deeds performed in the name and for the sake of Jesus our Lord and Saviour. We give you thanks and praise for your life-giving and life-extending love, O God. May your church help others to extend their lives and to rejoice in your world. We pray for all who are working for justice and freedom, 
for justice and freedom of captives, and for those who seek to bring food to the hungry and to comfort the lonely. We think of the many agencies that are trying to help the people of Haiti and of Afghanistan. Lord, as you raise us up, help us lift others out of their troubles. Our God is here. He comes to save us. We remember all who have worked hard and achieved nothing, all who have labored in vain or whose work has been frustrated and all whose work or livelihood has been destroyed. We pray for the unemployed, the homeless, for those who will soon need to return to work. We pray for school teachers and those returning to school in these difficult COVID times. Our God is here. He comes to save us. We pray for your church, both where we are and for the Ipswich and East Pastorate and the wider United Reformed Church. We ask your special blessing on our new moderator on her recent induction to the Eastern Synod. Give Lithan perception and strength, especially in the choppy waters of post-COVID church life. Our God is here. He comes to save us. God, strengthen the bonds of community where we live. Direct all who have dealings with groups or care for individuals. We pray for all who feel isolated or cut off from others. We pray for our own homes and for our own loved ones. Our God is here. He comes to save us. We pray for all who have difficulties in communicating with others, those with hearing and speech difficulties and the blind. We pray for the many who are awaiting appointments or hospital treatment. For all who are finding their lives restricted through illness. And we pray today for Ian, Ian H. who is in hospital. In silence, we pray for those known to us who are in special need. Our God is here. He comes to save us. Lord, open our lives to your goodness, open our eyes to your presence, open our ears to your call, open our hearts to your love, open our lips to your praise, open us to your glory. Amen. We come to our time of communion. Again, the instructions, which we will probably be doing most of this year, but we'll see how things go. Please only remove your coverings briefly when consuming the elements. The elements will be served to you in your seats. If someone does not feel they want to receive the elements, please indicate to the server and the elements will not be offered. The bread will be dropped into your cupped hand by a serving elder. You are requested to take a communion cup from the tray, avoiding contact with unused cups. Please remove your face covering briefly to eat and drink as soon as you have received each element. Empty cups will be 
collected by the serving elders. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Anyone who comes to me, I will never turn away. Hear the narrative of the institution of the Lord's Supper as it is recorded by Saint Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, it is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, for you embrace your people now and forever and promise the kingdom to all who love you. The universe came into existence at your command, and the rich and poor alike have you as their maker. Through Moses you taught your people to provide for the welfare of those in need, and through the prophets you thundered against injustice and called for repentance in word and deed. In your Son, Jesus Christ, your love and healing mercy reach beyond the bounds of our prejudice and demonstrate your compassion for those who are needy, afflicted or vulnerable. Though he was killed by those who sow injustice, you raised him to new life that he might sow in us the seeds of faith, filling the community with love and justice and bringing forth a rich harvest of God's works, helping us proclaim his glorious life, death, and resurrection. Come, Creator God, renew the face of the earth. Come, Eternal Saviour, remake us in your likeness. Come, Holy Spirit, transform these gifts that Christ may be known to us in the breaking of bread and that we might be strengthened to serve him in the world. May we on earth be one with all Christ's people and when all things are complete, be raised up with him and with all your faithful servants in heavenly places, the homeland which we seek by faith and where he reigns in glory with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The bread which we break is the communion in the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion in the blood of Christ, God's gift for all of God's people. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So take, eat, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. This cup is the new covenant of the blood of Christ shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of him.
Gracious God, may the love which bids us welcome at this table gather all your children to one in your eternal presence, whole and free at last. Let's sing our final hymn, Tell Out My Soul the Greatness of the Lord. For generosity and compassion. Fulfill God's holy law by putting love into action as eagerly for others as you would for yourselves. And may God be your defender and provider. May Christ Jesus dispel all that disturbs or disables you. And may the Holy Spirit make you rich in faith and loving and merciful action. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>